Well, Colorado Athletic Director Rick George actually said something about realignment that's very clear, direct, and to the point. And he reminds me a lot of that chocolate vanilla ice cream swirl. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked on Pack 12 I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our beloved and media rights-free Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show. Tons to get to today, including the comments of one Rick George, who had uh, a couple of things to say in a wide ranging interview with Buff Zone, but the most notable comments were with regards to everybody's favorite topic in the month of May. We're almost to June and less than 100 days away to the start of the college football season realignment. Everybody loves realignment and media rights. We're starting to come up on that like kind of crunch time zone for the Pac 12. And this is a very clear and direct stance of how Colorado actually feels not speculative not you know rumors run rampant and they're about to go to the big 12 which was flying around on the internet for quite some time and then that didn't happen but colorado athletic director rick george had some really interesting quotes here and i think there are a couple uh, of of notes that i want to make about that uh in in just a moment but he said quote you've got to believe about a third of what you see out there a third. We're members of the Pac-12. We're proud members of the Pac-12. And we've got to see where our media rights deal lands and where our conference goes. In a perfect world, we'd love to be in the Pac-12. Do not want the Big 12. We'd love to be in the Pac-12. That was me interjecting there and emphasizing that particular point. But we also have to do what's right for Colorado at the end of the day. We'll evaluate things as we move forward. So this is actually a really clear and I think very honest comment from the Colorado Athletic Director. Now, why did I mention chocolate vanilla swirl ice cream here? Because he is in the camp of having a little bit of both. He is he he didn't want chocolate ice cream. He didn't want vanilla ice cream either. He might like one more than the other, right? And he clearly does. Let's say the Pac-12 is chocolate ice cream and or frozen yogurt and the Big 12 is vanilla just as a random uh selection of flavors. He may look at chocolate the Pac-12 and say I I would love I would really, really love to to just have chocolate ice cream. But I also have to deal with the reality of the situation here, which is my wife is inevitably going to want some of this, and she likes chocolate and vanilla and will like a little bit of both. I also like vanilla, so I will get the swirl. So he's dipping his toe into the water here of both potential outcomes. Now, the, the, the takeaway I have of this comment here, the question that I ask myself is what's the number? And that's a number that you don't know, that I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know. I could, but that would be dishonest. And that's never what I've been about here on the show. Rick George might not even know it. I imagine he's got an inclination. But their president, Phil DiStefano, is the guy who actually will end up making the decision as to whether or not Colorado decides to stay in the Pac-12 or goes to the Big 12 here. So that was the first thing I asked, is what's the number, right? If he is openly and directly, right? This is not a speculative read between the tea leaves sort of thing. This is a very open, honest, and direct comment, which I and many of you probably as well can greatly appreciate because we've gotten a lot of wishy-washy stuff. You know, Arizona, uh, there that Robert Robbins was on the air and he was saying, oh, like Lubbock's not that far away. Ah, but we're not doing that. Why would we go for a few million more and all that sort of stuff? And Arizona State, it's been like, ah, kind of iffy. Utah's been pretty clear. Like they're shutting this down. Colorado, I think, is pretty clearly saying here, yeah, if we get forced in the Big 12, we will. But we don't know what the number is. And we don't know what the timeline is either. And I, f- I find the timeline component to be fascinating. Because think about this. Does anybody doubt that the Big 12 would take any of the so-called four-corner schools at any point in time? No? 
Me neither. I think they take him whenever that is. Now, the deadline everybody's following here is June 30th, because June 30th is when the exit fee would double for San Diego State to notify the Mountain West that they were leaving. So if they're going to add San Diego State, have them in the conference for the 2024-25 season, June 30th is kind of looking like a hard deadline here for the Pac-12. But for Colorado, right, they might not have that sort of deadline because we heard Ray Anderson indicate the deal might get announced mid to late summer, which, you know, God help us all if that happens because then you really start to think like, okay, what, what kind of deal are we getting here? Or why is this taking so long? And, you know, we can talk about that ad nauseum here on the show. But for Colorado, I don't think there's any timeline that they have to be on, right? Everybody's ramping up this pressure about, oh my gosh, Colorado's going to jump and, and Colorado's going to get antsy. Why is Colorado going to get antsy? They have a stated desire to be in the Pac-12. And their athletic director is here saying, yeah, we want to wait and see what that media deal looks like, which is a pretty reasonable approach. I think it's a very reasonable approach. We got to do what's in the best interests of the University of Colorado or CU, as it's known, because they don't want to be confused with the UC system. That's why they're CU and not UC, if you didn't know. But they don't have to decide by that June 30th timeline, right? That's with regards to San Diego State and I believe SMU as well for the Pac-12. But for keeping everybody else interested, the timeline can extend here because Colorado's, you know, unofficial offer to go to the Big 12 where they have a pro rata clause to add any Power 5 school without dramatically reducing the, the payouts that go, you know, per institution. And the Big 12 has been very open and honest about the fact that they are going after those particular schools and they would like them. But when would Colorado actually have to make that decision to go to the Big 12? It doesn't have to be June 30th. It doesn't have to be July 5th. It doesn't have to be August 17th. It doesn't have to be September. They could decide. I'm not saying they could wait until, you know, June 30th of next year to decide, but they are not on the same timeline there. So all this talk of, you know, people saying Colorado's about to announce they're going to the Big 12, they don't need to. Because they're clearly stating here they want to be in the Pac-12. They want to see what the deal is. But if the deal doesn't come out, let, let's say, for instance, the deal is announced on, on July 7th. Why does Colorado need to announce now that they're going to the Big 12? Yeah, you need time to get into a new conference for sure. Again, that is a university question. But I don't think that their timeline, my point here, I don't think their timeline for that would be as rushed because – at any point in time, right, they could push. I, I, I'd i be willing to bet, given the position that the Big 12 is in and the amount of time that they've been knocking on the door and lobbying to get these schools, that Colorado has all the leverage here, that they could go to the Big 12 at any point in time, as late as possible, or maybe, maybe even after any particular hard deadline and say, Okay, yeah, we'd like to we'd like to go back over to the Big 12, which I don't think is particularly likely. But he is saying here, Rick George, the athletic director, very openly that, you know, we discuss all our options after we see the media deal and determine what's best for the University of Colorado. But is there a timeline on that front? I don't think there's much of one for Colorado. There's a timeline for the Pac-12 to get San Diego State and SMU. But I don't think they've got, you know, a big urgency. here. I don't think it's, you know, they have to act or Colorado is going to jump like Colorado can afford to be patient here because the big 12 would leap at the opportunity to, for the first time ever in realignment, grab another power five school. At least I believe that is correct that they've only had schools depart. They haven't had any power five come into their conference in the last, at, at least in the last 15 years or so, since all this realignment stuff really uh, started to shake out because Missouri left and Nebraska left, Texas A&M left. And somebody else left, and I forget. Call oh, Colorado, duh. <laughs> nice one, Spencer. Okay. Anyway, that was my thoughts on uh, that particular comment, which was the first like actual tangible, clear, and I think honest comment uh, about where school sits in this in this uh, particular situation. But we have more to get to on uh, the realignment front uh, with regards to the Bay Area school and the Big Ten. 
But we have more to get to about how great Built Bars are, because truly, they are delicious. They're covered in 100% real dark chocolate. Do you like chocolate? I like chocolate. And whether you're buying a Built Bar or whether you're buying a Built Puff, they're covered in that yummy, delicious, wonderful, 100% real chocolate. Their macros are also incredible. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, a whopping 17 grams of protein, and their flavors are incredible. Churro, mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream. They've got everything that you need. I've always got them in my golf bag. I've always got them in the pantry, all that sort of stuff. They're always loaded there because they are Great. So go to built.com to get your next specialty flavor or go to your local Walmart, head to the pharmacy section, get a four box of cookies and cream or chocolate bar or coconut puff, whatever tickles your fancy there. Or you can go to Sam's Club, get a 13 bar box with hit flavors, brownie batter puff and churro puff. Do so whichever way you feel is best to get your next order of built bars and then thank me later. All righty. Going to take a sip of water real quick so we can kind of reload and refresh. Shout out Lake of the Woods, Pacific Northwest. Okay, this question comes in from Sky, and you can always be part of the mailbag. YouTube comments or Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore PAC 12. DMs and mentions wide open. Hop in there, shoot me a question, get it answered here on the show and be a part of the program. Mailbag from Sky. Oregon and Washington are the obvious top two teams remaining in the PAC 12. From a television standpoint, yes. If the Big Ten added more pack teams they would likely be the top two tar or they would be the likely top two targets stanford and cal i don't think that was worded exactly how i was hoping for but stanford and cal are kind of in this murky middle ground would they bring any benefit to the big 10 outside of academics assuming stanford and cal do not join the big 10 would stanford and cal be happy remaining in the pac-12 if less prestigious universities were brought into the pac-12 Okay, so two-part question here. question here. Let's get to the first part. So the Big Ten is a superior academic conference than the Pac-12. If an offer came along to Stanford and Cal, which are by far the torch-bearing institutions academically and kind of culturally in the Pac-12 now, right? Not, not athletically. I said academically and culturally, and that I believe to be true. If they were to get an offer to go to the Big Ten, I have a hard time seeing them say no. And I don't think athletics would be the top reason why. But if you go look at the biggest research institutions in the country and great academic schools, they are littered in the Big Ten. Michigan, Ohio State, we think of them as football powers, big research schools. Michigan especially, big time academic school, hard school to get into. By the way, I my one of my college roommates, he uh, went to went with me to, of course, we didn't go there together, but like we got uh, paired together at, at Santa Clara and he was trying to get into Michigan. He hadn't gotten in there at first, but then he went to Santa Clara. He was killing it in the classroom and then he was able to get into Michigan later. So. It's not an easy place to get into and it's a big research institution. Northwestern, by the way is very much like Stanford and Cal. Like th those schools have a lot in common. So I think if an offer came along, even if everybody else was staying put, Stanford and Cal would go to the Big Ten. And certainly if Oregon and Washington had already been selected, I think they would go and say, look, let the academic or the athletics do whatever they're going to do or perform however they'll end up performing. But the opportunity to be in the Big Ten, I think, would be too great for Stanford and Cal to pass up because that sort of academic alignment means a lot to these university presidents, especially at those institutions. And I think they would absolutely take that. Now, would they bring any benefit to that conference outside of academics? The, the only questions as to what a school brings to your conference, athletics, academics i guess tv market and culture are parts of that i think culturally stanford and cal fit perfectly in the big 10 and tv market wise i think would be the one thing that that you may be left out here that i'd say that could be some value is having more access to the bay area like if you go look at the top 20 media markets in the united states that's where a lot of these conferences want to go and why losing los angeles is so crushing for the pac-12 and their media deal 
Los Angeles is the number two market in the country. So if you're going up and down the West Coast, the most valuable media markets are Los Angeles, and I'm pretty sure the Bay Area. And then I think you'd go uh, Seattle and then Portland if you're talking just like cities and, and areas. So that's the other thing that they would bring to, to the Big Ten. But you have to couple that with, well, are they going to be able to you know generate big followings and fan bases? And it's not as if they don't have fans. It's not as if they've never put – like there, there's – Bay Area athletics right now are super down, right, in a number of ways. But they have greater potential than, say, Oregon State or Washington State because they've got more money and they've got more people as well. Like, they just have more people that go to their schools. They have more people surrounding the schools. Now, Oregon State sells out their stadium much easier than Stanford does. But I've seen Stanford Stadium. I've seen the farm packed to the brim before it has happened now they are not the sorts of fans who show up when times are tough but when times are great i've seen them put a lot of fans i, I went to that oregon stanford game in 2011 it was a really fun trip uh, that i went on with, with with friends and family it was actually one of the most memorable trips in my childhood of which there were fortunately for me several but like i remember that one very vividly and you know what i remember the environment in that stadium it was electric stanford's got a great tailgate scene by the way you got grass fields you can go on you got the big trees like it, it's absolutely awesome i've been to several football games out there and it's great now the question for those schools especially stanford because cal as i've talked about here on the show and everydayers are aware of have the number 15 transfer portal class in the country this offseason stanford hasn't yet decided to amend the culture, bend the rules, change their ways, and allow for a massive influx of transfers. And it remains to be seen, though the early returns aren't great given how it's gone the last couple of years for David Shaw, whether or not they can compete from a roster standpoint with the rest of the teams in the country. But so it's not as if those schools in football specifically, have never been good. Go look at the history of Cal football. Go look at Cal when, you know, Jared Goff was there. Go look at Cal when Aaron Rodgers was there. I remember last year, pretty sure it was last year, Marshawn Lynch and Justin Forsett were on uh, the broadcast as special guests. They just, like, came on, put headsets on and everything. We're doing live interviews for, I think, the Cal-Washington game, right? It was a late-night kickoff and Washington was good, and Cal was, you know, still trying to find their way. They, of course, ended the season four and eight, but Marshawn Lynch looked around and, you know, <laughs> dropped some swear words live on national television, which, like, it's Marshawn Lynch. He's a national treasure. What are you going to do? He looked around at the crowds that were showing up to Memorial Stadium and, were, and was basically saying, what, what are we doing here? Like, this isn't what this stadium was when I was here. We were packing the house. We were winning games. We were a good program there. I don't think it's impossible for them to get back to that level, right? You've got a solid talent base of, of recruiting in the Bay Area. You've got money at the schools. You have won games before. They just have to have the necessary internal commitments, and they've got to have the right coaches in place. And we'll see if Wilcox can turn things around. And I'm optimistic about what they could do this season. And we'll see what Troy Taylor can do at Stanford. So I think they have the potential to bring athletic value. Can they be conference contenders year in and year out in the Big Ten? No, probably not. But I don't even think UCLA can do that. And I think it's, you know, a, a, a dicey proposition to say USC will contend for a conference championship, you know, as an expectation every single year if and when the Big Ten gets rid of divisions, I believe they are, and you have Michigan and Ohio State and Penn State in the mix. Like, it's just going to be a constant battle between those four programs. So when you're talking about Stanford and Cal, it's not as if they're incapable or there's never been an instance in which they've provided athletic value. They just don't right now. Can that change? It can it would require an internal commitment, but it's far from impossible. It, it is it is far, far from impossible. It's not like you're at Indiana, which is a basketball school, and that's what the school cares about the most. And, you know, their commitment to football, eh, it's just okay. Are they going to, you know, pony up big money for coaches or anything like that? Like, you know, probably not, right? They, they, they'll have a good season every now and then and such. The Bay Area schools have got plenty of money at their university. They got plenty of wealthy donors. 
it, it, it's about a mindset for them. And if they change that, yeah, they could bring more than just academics, but that it, that would be the biggest thing that you would know for sure they could bring to the big 10 more access to California and the Bay area media market would be part of that as well. Now, the second part of your question, Sky, assuming Stanford and Cal do not join the Big Ten, would Stanford and Cal be happy remaining in the Pac-12 if less prestigious universities were brought into the Pac-12? The answer to that question is yes, as long as Oregon and Washington are there, especially Washington. So if you keep Oregon and Washington on board, I don't think Stanford and Cal want to go anywhere. They might say yes if the Big Ten comes calling, but I don't think they're going to actively seek it out necessarily. I, I don't get that impression and the reporting that we've seen with regards to which schools have met with which conferences over you know the last several months and all this sort of stuff. I don't think that they have a burning desire to wind up in the Big Ten. I think they would take it if the opportunity came about, but I think they're fine where they're at because they are the academic and cultural bell cows, excuse me, of the Pac-12. And then Washington is probably just a half step below them on that front. But having the association with Washington, Colorado is a big research school as well. As long as the Pac-12 is adding, you know, what you're saying are less prestigious universities. So I'm going to talk about again in just a moment. As long as they're the right type of universities, I don't think they mind. Like, did Stanford and Cal mind when, uh, when Utah joined the Pac-12? No. Utah now is, you know, more than sextupled the amount of, uh, research dollars that they get as a school because of their association with Stanford and Cal uh, on, on on the one hand and because of, you know, cultural changes they've implemented the university on, on another. So I think Stanford and Cal are fine where they're at. If they got a, a chance to go to the Big Ten, I think they would. But I don't, I don't get the sense that they want to go there as badly as Oregon and Washington do. I think they'd rather everything else stay put. Last question here from MC. Question, how much do you think the network's or whomever streamers would have value or, or would value San Diego state and SMU or to be split from the existing PAC 12 schools cut. Well, there, there's some inherent value of a school that's in the state of Texas. And there's some inherent value of a school that is in Southern California, right? Having a university in those particular locations is inherently of some value because of demographics and just the number of people that are there, number of young people that are there and all that sort of stuff. I don't think that they look at San Diego state and SMU and, you know, think of them the same way you would a UCLA or a TCU, right. From a viewership standpoint, we know that that's not true, but was TCU, which is one of the 20 most viewed teams in all of college football a season ago, would that have been their value immediately when they made the jump to power five? No. Right. At one point in time, I'm pretty sure they were in the whack. And at one point in time, I know they were in, they came from the mountain West. So their value then was not as high as their value is now. And so with San Diego state and SMU, it may not be super immediate, but I think media executives are smart enough to see like, you can grow your brand and become a more attractive television product, right? Like think about SMU. They're a comeback story of sorts. They are. They absolutely are. Because if they were to return to the national stage one day in the Pac-12, that would be a story with national appeal because they got the death penalty long ago. And that hasn't happened, I don't believe, to another college football program. But most notably, it happened to SMU, and a lot of people remember that. And to go from that to then if you put it all together at the Power 5 level, yeah, of course, that would become a compelling story. So the long-term viability of SMU growing their football brand, yeah, it's a, it's a tall order. There, nobody's making any bones about that. But TCU has done that very thing in the state of Texas as a small private Christian school Hmm. Comparison, maybe, possibly. Anyway, they have done that while Texas existed, while Texas A&M existed, while Baylor existed, Houston existed, all these other teams in the state of Texas, Texas Tech, they were all there. And yet TCU has raised their profile, has raised their viewership dramatically. And so Dallas 
And the Fort Worth area is one of the, I believe, 10 most highly sought after media markets in the United States. In fact, I'll look that up uh, real quick. According to DMA market ratings, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, Dallas, Fort Worth. So having a school that's in that area that you could realistically see as becoming a bigger football brand in the region going forward in a top five national media market. Yeah, of course, that has some value. And and same thing with Southern California, right? Los Angeles losing that absolute bummer and a half for the Pac-12. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It stinks. But you're losing about 6 million television homes. You're regaining about one and a half, between one and one and a half, if you add San Diego State and the San Diego area. And that, again, has some inherent value. Now, how much? It's hard to say. I could sit here and speculate for for 20 minutes about how much that is. But if the Pac-12 can get an average media deal that amongst the 10 teams is let's just say, for instance, $300 million, you know, $30 million per school with the 10. If you add the other two, w- would it add another $30 million, $50 million, $100 million, $20 million, $10 million? That's for That's for me, people, to know and for us to later find out. But do they bring something to the table? Yes, they can. In the short run, eh, maybe not for the television ratings, but in the long run, I think absolutely. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.